Clock check. We're heading to the Everest Base Camp. Fantastic, and this was our golden goal, and we're heading yeah. for yeah. <laughs> Just 10 days ago, 14 men embarked on a trek through the Himalayas, uncertain of the outcome. And after 40 miles of trekking at elevations beyond 17,000 feet, all 14 men arrived together at base camp on the southern side of Mount Everest. So you talk a lot about the true summit. What is the false summit? Um, I think the false summit is always, it's always geographic. It's always an achievement. It's always a box that you check. It's uh, career advancement. It's um, all these temporal things that we do primarily to feel better about ourselves and to maybe perhaps uh, help other, people's, other people think more highly of us. Um, that to me would be more of a false summit where it's always connected with a false identity. Those two always go hand in hand. And it's really as simple as this. If you don't know who you are, you will always be defined by what you do. I first met Kevin DeVries back in 1998. He was a national ministry leader who at the time had never climbed a mountain. We had a brief conversation, unaware that Kevin's life would soon take a drastic turn, marking the beginning of a journey that 25 years later would lead us both to the Himalayas. We made it, man. Made it to Lukla. Yep, world's most dangerous airport. About 9,000 some odd feet, runway that drops off into nothing. It feels good to actually do something. All this nervous energy and adrenaline is now being put to use. And uh, we got 14 guys with us and some world-class Sherpas. So we're pretty stoked. Looks like a great day ahead. Kevin, what do you think, man? Uh, this is pretty high. <laughs> and, uh, I don't know if you can see it on the video, but this thing is bouncing. <laughs> After we reach base camp, Kevin has made the surprising decision to continue ahead and summit a neighboring mountain in the region called Island Peak. It isn't the highest or the most difficult mountain Kevin's ever climbed, but it's significant because just two years ago, while training for a marathon, Kevin collapsed on the road after suffering a cardiac arrest. The EMTs on the scene were able to revive him only after he'd been dead for nearly 15 minutes. Now, only two years since his near-death experience, Kevin is attempting to summit again. The looming question, will this be a new chapter in Kevin's explorations or the end of his climbing career?
I've heard Kevin's story many times, but only one version of it. I want to know more about the mountains of his past to understand what's driving him to Island Peak today. Because we're here exactly 100 years after George Mallory's first summit attempt of Everest, I thought Mallory would be a good place to start. So in the 1920s, a reporter asked George Mallory, who arguably was the best climber of his generation, why he was climbing Everest. And he tersely replied, because it's there. And that's probably the best answer that most adventurous and most climbers and explorers have been able to give, is just to give a, a pretty obvious uh, answer to what could be uh, a bit of an unsettling question. I think George Mallory answered that way uh, largely in part because of a book that I read. It's called Into the Silence, and it's written by Wade Davis. It took him nearly a decade to write it, but he did a, a tremendous amount of research on all the British expeditionary members that went to Everest on the north side in 1921, 22, and 24, and came to the conclusion that um, because most of the men that were on that expedition were from World War I and fought on the Western Front in combat, that many of them were seeking the exact title of the book, which was Into Silence. They were trying to find a space of healing. They were trying to find a space where they could somehow forget or transcend some of the horror that they experienced. And I'm sure there was some of that collective sense of, wow, we need to make up for you know, a lost generation. I mean, World War I wiped out generations in Europe. I believe and agree with Wade Davis that these men were highly traumatized. The only word they had for it during that era was shell shock. But they were individuals who had already reconciled themselves to death. They'd already done that dance. They already knew what it was like to wake up every day and know it could be their last because millions of men were being killed on an unprecedented scale in human history. Mallory represents all of us where when there's an uncomfortable question that comes to the forefront, we dodge it as quick as we can uh, to not have to deal with some of the larger, uh, more hidden motives that cause us to do the things that we do. What if that same reporter would have asked you why you were climbing Rainier 25 years ago? What, what would you have said? Uh, I would have answered much the same. I was trying to find something in that moment that would literally, not just metaphorically, but literally help me transcend above the clouds of my own confusion, my own chaos, and, and capture some kind of sunrise. And to see that, not just visually, but to feel it and sense it in my soul that, wow, there could be a better tomorrow. And there is a place inside the human soul that the sun is always shining. And I was trying to find that space. In the past, whenever I've asked Kevin about his adventures, he's always been reluctant to talk about it. And it makes sense. It wasn't a spirit of adventure driving Kevin to the mountains. He was searching for healing. Something. Yeah, we're, we're 14. 
Um, so we just have to be patient. I understand that our body's trying to figure out what's going on, and there's just no error. And it's going to only get thinner and thinner as we go up, and um, it'll, be, it'll be harder and harder to sleep. In less than a week, our story will end, not at base camp, but here at Island Peak. Up to this point, Kevin has successfully summited every mountain he's ever climbed on the first attempt. But now, 10 years since his last climb, it seems like there's more at stake than just a summit. It's difficult to know what will cost him more, success, or failure. So you said you were looking for healing in the mountains. Um, what was the source of that wound? Can we go back to that event? So just like Mallory in the 1920s, who was driven, I believe, to climb mountains because of his uh, untreated shell shock from fighting on the Western Front in World War I, my first divorce drove me into the mountains and to the ends of the earth to try and somehow heal the pain that I was feeling inside and to somehow find a surgeon who could heal and take away the shrapnel that was in my soul. At the time, I was a national ministry leader and the way the first marriage ended, it just felt like a public spectacle and there was just a lot of shame and I ended up living ultimately a false narrative for a decade and a half after that. It was all about me. I'm gonna have a successful business. I'm gonna travel the world. I'm gonna summit every mountain. I'm gonna journey to the ends of the earth. But I found myself uh, at the end of that decade and a half in a very desperate situation where I felt totally disconnected from my own story. I just felt that I was fundamentally flawed that there was something about me that was unfixable. Um, I felt detached. I felt uh, a tremendous amount of despair, a tremendous amount of disengagement, where I was there, but I was not there. And there's nothing more desperate or despairing than to watch your life unfold and you can't connect with other people on a deep and meaningful level, the people that you want to love and the people that are trying to love you back. That disengagement um, and that despair led to a second divorce, a business bankruptcy, and shortly thereafter, living in a vehicle for uh, the next five years. I just felt like the situation was hopeless. There's a tremendous amount of despair when you enter into that space where you don't feel like your future is gonna be better than what it was in the past or ever will be. And it leads you into some, some pretty dark moments, you know, where you're trying to process, do I still wanna stay in this story? Kevin's story is all too common. For many, the greatest power in the world is shame. Through the wounds and failures of our past, shame tells us we're unfixable, fundamentally flawed, and we believe it. More than anything in the world, we believe it. So we climb higher and higher, no matter the cost. 
searching for transformation just beyond the clouds. Unaware that no summit in the world has the power to change who failure says we are. So we're off to Kalapatar, about 18,500 feet, taller than anything in Europe and a couple of other continents as well. And we're uh, ready to get at it. This is nuts, man. Trekkers go in both directions. Rocks are covered in ice. And then yaks. So I'm standing right now at about the same exact height as Mount Ararat. And now we find ourselves in the Everest region, nowhere near <laughs> any of the peaks that surround us. So you reach a point where you're living in your truck for five years. A lot of people don't make it back from that place. What was the turning point for you? So from uh, 2009 to 2013, I served as a lead mountaineer for a group of scientists on Mount Ararat uh, in Turkey. Uh, that particular region of the world um, borders Iran. It's just 10 clicks away. There's a tremendous amount of geopolitical tension that's existed there for decades. Tens of thousands of people have been uh, killed between the PKK and in return, the Turkish army has done pretty much the same. And Mount Ararat happens to be right in the epicenter of that. So um, to keep ourselves safe, uh, as a group of mostly Americans, we always had a security detail with us every year. And in 2013, the guys that we had gathered while we were filming a documentary basically pulled me aside and just said, hey, you know, uh, we've been watching you and we feel like um, you've got what we got. They said, when we look into your eyes, it's this 2,000 yard vacuous stare. The lights are on, nobody's home. And then they went on to say something that was incredibly powerful and I'll poetically synthesize it, but they essentially said, you have a lot of pain in your past and you're punishing your past as a result of it. You have not reconciled yourself with some difficult parts of your story. And it's rather obvious that you're running from that. And this whole project that we were all a part of this documentary was a great distraction um, to help me not to think about those things and to um, just get me you know, give me some kind of distance from those uh, type of memories. And then they also said, because you're punishing your past, you're also fearing your future. There's a lot of anxiety. It's like you're always waiting for the next foot to fall. You're waiting for um, some type of other incident or event to happen that's going to change the trajectory of your life in a, in a negative way. And then they went on to say something that I'll never forget. They said, because you're punishing your past and because you're fearing your future, you're never now. You're just not here. You're not present. And that struck a huge chord because that was the first time I, I believe 
um, well, at least that I was able to listen to. I'm sure other people attempted the same, uh, many counselors, but to have these three special ops guys uh, speak that into my life, uh, it gave me a clue as to uh, how my story had developed over all of these years. It gave me some breadcrumbs along the trail. It gave me um, something of substance that I could identify and that I could uh, seek healing for, which was trauma. So 25 years ago, you go to Rainier because you're broken, you're looking for healing, life's falling apart. Um, you go to Ararat and you identify trauma. So what is different about the Kevin who's climbing 25 years later here? And what would help to bring about the change that you were looking for? Yeah. Well, um, people will notice throughout uh, this story that we're telling together that Kevin is not alone. He's with a group of men and we are encouraging one another and we're journeying together because we like to say in our fellowship, uh, change happens in community. It doesn't happen as an individual. And that's hard for men to understand because we tend to embrace the cowboy mythos, you know, the individualism, the, the guy that lives alone on a big giant ranch. They're just waiting for someone to step over the fence so they could do something. And I think men uh, treat their interior geography in much the same way. Don't get too close. And the old Kevin would have been doing this just for Kevin. And it would have been just Kevin. And he wouldn't have invited anybody else to be part of this journey because the journey was about him. It was that way because Kevin didn't know who he was. Together, we die alone. It's fitting that our journey ends where it all began. Exactly 100 years ago today, George Mallory was preparing to attempt his first summit of Everest. Maybe he was climbing out of sheer joy, or maybe trauma really was at the heart of it all. We'll never know for sure. But we know now why Kevin was climbing all those years ago. His belief that he was unfixable and fundamentally flawed drove him to the mountains, searching for a new identity, only to find it in a brotherhood. But now, Kevin is climbing Island Peak. If he's already found healing, then after all these years, what's he trying to prove? The next morning, the trekking team heads back to Kathmandu, while Kevin and three other team members continue ahead to prepare for their summit of Island Peak.
I thought there was only one way to successfully end this story. Kevin, arms raised, victoriously summiting Island Peak. Get some great summit footage, roll the credits. But just two days into his ascent, for the first time in his life, Kevin decided not to climb. And surprisingly, he was thrilled. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized this trip wasn't about his heart or his successful summit. Kevin wasn't trying to prove to the world that he could still climb. He was proving to himself that he no longer needed to. So two years ago, you die, and now you're summoning Island Peak. But what if your heart doesn't hold out and this is the end of your climbing career? You know, after two divorces, a bankruptcy, living in a vehicle for five years, and then experiencing a near-death experience some two and a half years ago, um, I've just come to discover and I've come to the conclusion that I am not defined by what I do. And as a young man, I couldn't say that. As a middle-aged man, I can say uh, that's true. I'm not defined by what I do. I'm defined by who I am and whose I am. And that to me means that I am a, a beloved son of Almighty God. And that's enough. There's nothing left to prove. There's nothing I can do to make him love me more. There's nothing I can do to uh, make people think that I'm, I'm somehow greater than what I am. Um, yeah, Everest literally sits outside this tent and, and Everest Base Camp is what we are on. Right now, I'm leaving Glacier called Everest Base Camp. Um, but it's just, I, I don't really care. And it's not to diminish the people who, that's their dream. I was there, you know, just a few years ago even. Um, but it is to say that I've reached a place where I feel like I've already climbed Everest within. I feel like I've, I've already uh, climbed those summits and life to me now means more if it's done with people and if it's done together where you climb together as a group and you find that true summit. Um, it's a spiritual space and it's a space where change can happen because you're allowing other people to speak into your life and you're allowing yourself to listen to your life and to learn the tale that it's telling and it has to happen. Uh, through this inward journey, which to me uh, requires more courage. It's much easier to climb a mountain. It's much harder to climb the mountain within. But that's where I think we do our best work as brothers in Christ, is we invite each other into the greatest journey of all, which is within. I'd always heard people talk about the call, the call that changes your life. And I, you know, like intellectually understood you know, a cancer diagnosis, someone dying who you did not expect to die. And then I got a call like that. I got the call that flipped my life upside down. So Christmas 2020, we're in Peoria. That's where my wife's from, visiting the in-laws. House is full of family, her sister, their kids, our kids. And get a message super early in the morning and it's my sister who says, hey, when you get this, give us a call. I call back. Hey, what's going on? Hey, um, dad died this morning. And my brain fries, like doesn't compute. I'm like, what? And then the call drops. I like run into the house, call back and It wasn't a it wasn't a nightmare. It was it was reality, um, sudden and unexpected. So I, it's out of nowhere. I mean, I'd, I'd talked to him a few days before. Thankfully, I was with some of my favorite people in the whole world. You know, my mother and father-in-law, my wife, her sister, and our kids. And I come in and just say, "My dad died this morning," and we just we just howled and wailed for a nice five or ten minutes so okay I lost my dad sooner than I would have expected but with our working relationship I also lost my best employee lost really my best friend like day to day and so it's kind of that I don't know trifecta gut punch of 
yes, I have the grief of the moment of, of losing a father, but then like the weeks and months of dealing with, you know, not having a best friend and best employee day to day in the work environment, it affected my entire life, um, you know, to this day, honestly. The scope of my relationship with my dad is a very roller coastery one. I think as a traditional young child, your dad's your hero. He's the greatest thing since sliced bread, can do no wrong. Um, and that was really my view of my dad into my mid upper 20s. And then as my own story became unpacked and started to ask questions like, why am I this way? Why do I do the things that I don't want to do? How did I get like this? I started to see my dad in a different light because I saw my faults in him. So the answer of how to get this way is, well, because my dad's like this. And so there was a um, nice, solid five, six years where I, I really resented him. And there was a, there, we had a, a healing moment. It was really just a private moment um, where I was thinking through, I was thinking through content for a marriage retreat and came across this crazy poster, a, a real life advertisement for the Pony Express. And it listed the qualifications they were looking for in a Pony Express rider. Young, wiry fellows, willing to risk death daily. And at the bottom, this phrase, orphans preferred. And that just hit me like a ton of bricks at my dining table at two in the morning all by myself. It's like God was telling me, this is how I want my kingdom workers. I want them to be willing to risk death daily. And I kind of prefer it if they have a healthy distance from their earthly parents. You know, all the language of the New Testament talking about adoption, and you ask the question, well, who gets adopted? And the answer is orphans. Orphans get adopted. And I felt like, to, be, to fully embrace my adoption into God's family, I needed to have a healthy orphan spirit with my earthly parents and really release them from their responsibility for my spiritual health and release them from their faults, release them from their brokenness. And that night, I felt like I went through that. I said, what am I doing being angry with my parents? They're amazing. What am I doing resenting my dad? He's awesome. And so the next day, just by chance, it was a Thursday night, we're just by chance scheduled to go have pizza night with our kids. So my folks, my wife, my two kids, just pizza night over there at their house. And just, you know, to me, it seemed like a normal interaction. On the way home, I'm driving in the car. My wife says, what happened to you? You treated your dad so different. I just told her, you know, God did a miracle last night. And I mean, that was six, seven years before his death. And honestly, that was six, seven years of father, son, best friend, releasing of anger and resentment acknowledgement of you know, mutual brokenness and um, yeah that that spirit of judgment and resentment really just just lifted that night I just had have had a very blessed life knew all of my grandparents knew my knew most of my great-grandparents so there wasn't this ever this sense of someone being taken from me or f before their time and then the few months following intensified the grief for our whole family. So my dad and then his mom, my last remaining grandparent dies. And then um, the day before her funeral, my sister dies. And then my other sister um, lost a baby during pregnancy. So father, grandma, sister, 
Nice. Boom, 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 boom. So going from never have, never having dealt with that, to all of a sudden like it being piled on, uh, was you know it was it was it was crushing. It was crushing. Yeah. So knowing that it was going to be new, my eyes were really, really wide open to okay, how how am I, how am I doing? How am I dealing with this? This is a new thing. I want to do it well. I mean. For lack of a better term, I, I don't know how you do it well, but I wanted to like um, not go off the deep end, whatever that would mean. I don't even know what that would mean for me at this point in my life and my journey. What I do know is it's hard. It's hard to go on in this new paradigm where my dad's not here. Many of my biggest breakdowns were alone in my gym pushing weight, listening to music, and just sobbing, just missing my dad. Would spend sometimes days just, just kind of catatonic, just unmotivated, uninterested. So I wanted to be transparent with my wife, with the guys that I walk with, with anytime in a small group, like being very honest, like I'm, I'm not doing well. At, at some point I got tired of saying that, honestly. We're talking, you know, months into it. I can tell this is, not like it's not healthy anymore like sure give me some period of time of like intense grief yes but now it's like okay this is really affecting like my life how i parent how the kind of husband i am the kind of <laughs> the kind of employer i am and i felt like okay i don't know what to do but i know i need to do something and then i think the email comes across hey there's an opportunity to go to mount everest base camp felt like Walter Mitty in the scene where adventure wildlife photographer invites him to come into the wild, to come into the adventure. And I really felt like God was doing that to me and got so giddy. Like, yeah, <laughs> that's what I need to do. I need to go to Nepal <laughs> and, and touch the base of Mount Everest. This idea of this is going to be a marker, this is going to be a stake in the ground where I decide that all that living in the past, that not being present, that just being sad all the time, that that was going to have an end date. <laughs> I thought, okay, well, at some point we're going to be at some picturesque peak and I'm going to have some of his ashes with me and I'm going to say goodbye in really, really epic fashion that he would absolutely go crazy for. Okay, my first Marco Polo ever. I thought I would start with a big announcement. As many of you know, I'm taking some of Mr. R Sr. with me on the trip to uh, say farewell in grand fashion. But, how would this be done? What mode of transport would I choose, could I choose, to be inconspicuous? So came up with a great idea, I think great idea, and also very symbolic. So, I give to you the ultimate steak seasoning rub. I can just feel seniors' pleasure smiling down. So was kind of lo looking, like always kind of looking and thinking about how it would be done, where, with whom, privately. I mean, I just, I didn't know. But in the back of my mind, I thought, well, I'm going to wait till we're like somewhere really high and really beautiful. And that's when I'll do it. And for us, you know, on the trip, really high was Calipatar. Well, as you guys know, I've, I've brought my dad. It's a 
hard ass 24 hours. I mean that hike yesterday, highest elevation, headache, couldn't eat, couldn't sleep, freezing ass bed, getting up this morning, that hike, and this was tough. This was, this was tough. one of the toughest 24 hours I've had but not as hard as losing my dad and my best friend about a year ago and I really wanted to give him an epic send off <laughs> this is a <laughs> damn epic place to send him off because he's a he was an epic guy he loved people uh, better than anyone I've ever met and I want to miss him but this is a final send off for me so glad I'm here with you guys. Even higher. send off the stake in the ground idea or the or the rocks of remembrance building an altar those things i think serve two purposes one is the moment but then as life continues it serves as a reference point as a stake in the ground so i start to feel myself not being present being overcome by sadness I can say, no, that, that ended on the top of Kalapatar in Nepal. I remember that moment. It was a serious moment. A lot of stuff happened in that moment. And it's something to draw back on where you get to remind yourself continuously, you know, dozens and dozens of times maybe. And then those times get fewer and farther between. And the next thing you know, you look back and say, yeah, that was the turning point because God did a miracle, maybe. Because I decided it was going to be like that, maybe. Yes, both, all the above. And so I think there is power in not only the ability and taking the reins of your own story and saying, I'm gonna decide to do something different. But then also having that stake in the ground, that physical thing, whether it's you know grabbing a rock and writing on it like we do here at the house, or doing something crazy like ashes on the top of Kalapatar, that those serve as a reminder to yourself. That you said, nope. nope. So when you start to feel the, the depression drag or the sadness kind of overcome you, you say, no, 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 that's not how we do things because I put that stake in the ground. And it's something to kind of remind yourself. So, I, you know, I won't ever be over missing my dad but I do feel different, I, it is different. I had a grief counselor tell me one time, grief is the price of love. Like, if you give your heart to something, that it's that, to that level that you can be hurt. Um, that's why a lot of people don't <laughs> in the first place, but that the pain is indicative of the love. And, and you know, what I traded away would I say, oh, I don't want to feel like this, but the cost is you don't get to feel that love on the front end. And of course I wouldn't trade that away.